Senator John F. Kennedy's marriage to Jacqueline Bouvier didn't slow the pace of his life. It did quicken the pace of hers. It wasn't long before she did something she never would have dreamed of doing. She broke an ankle playing touch football. Charles Bartlett. This tremendous buoyancy in the Kennedys was always there, you know, and I think that they were just the way they've always been, which is, you know, playing games and talking and excited and in motion. And now the excitement and the motion extended to his adopted home, William Walton. Oh, he had an absolutely marvelous time in this town and was crazy about Washington, and it became his own hometown. He knew all the streets and the houses, and he'd known where everybody lived, and uh, he had a great feeling for the town. Lemoyne Billings. He just absolutely loved it, being in the Senate. I mean, it was a tremendous challenge to him. He really was a man that was happy in his job. But his happiness in his job was increasingly being overshadowed by an old problem, the pain in his back. Kay Halley. He was talking to me, and he was leaning against the back of a chair, and the girl who was sitting on the other side of it got up without his knowing it, and the chair collapsed, and he went smack on the floor, and he hit on the bottom of his spine. And I saw his face go absolutely white. The doctors had given conflicting advice. He himself decided on surgery. And on October 21st, 1954, he entered the hospital for a complicated operation. Lemoyne Billings. One very unsuccessful operation. And he was in extreme pain for three or four months. I mean, just unbearable pain. Where this thing didn't heal. It was just, you know, it was a real fiasco, his first operation. His second operation was more successful, but not ever completely successful. It was discouraging because there didn't seem to be any hope. It was a very bad period in his life. Well, I remember going up to see him in the hospital for special surgery, and he was very ill, and then, of course, he went down to Florida, and they stayed in the family's house, which I suppose is never easy for a bride. And I think that, uh, you know, if you had a lot to do with his convalescence. As Charles Bartlett remembers, Jackie Kennedy, during those months, interested her husband in painting, helped him keep up with events in Washington, and encouraged his work on a book he wanted to write. It was called Profiles in Courage. He got a board, and he was flat on his back, and I don't think he could use much of a pillow, but he had this board that he sort of wrote on his back in longhand, and then the secretary would take and type up the pages as he went. But on his back, he wrote this thing. On his back, he wrote... The courage of life is often a less dramatic spectacle than the courage of a final moment, but it is no less a magnificent mixture of triumph and tragedy. To be courageous requires no exceptional qualifications, no magic formula, no special combination of time, place, and circumstance. It is an opportunity that, sooner or later, is presented to us all. We used to go out and talk to him about it, talk to him about the political situation. Even when he was really dying, literally dying, he was still fascinated by what was going on in Congress and the developments that were taking place. His political interest didn't flicker for a moment. He wasn't able to walk down the aisle of the Senate again until late in May 1955. When he did, the Senate rose to its feet to applaud him. In spite of the doctor's misgivings, he was back in impressive motion. A year later, first in his home state and then elsewhere, buttons began showing up that read... Kennedy for vice president. Texas proudly casts its vote for that fighting sailor who wears the scars of battle and that fearless senator, the next vice president of the United States, John Kennedy of Massachusetts. And so it came to a battle on the floor of the 1956 Democratic Convention. Lyndon Johnson's Texas was joined by enough other delegations that Senator Kennedy outdistanced his leading rival, Estes Kefauver of Tennessee, on the second ballot and seemed on the way to winning a nomination he had not expected. But the Midwestern and mountain states held firm for Kefauver. Missouri shifted to Kefauver. The tide turned. And a few minutes later, the nation heard a new voice. Ladies and gentlemen of uh, this convention, I want to uh, take this opportunity first to express my appreciation to Democrats from all parts of the country, north and south, east and west, who have been uh, so generous and kind to me uh, this afternoon, recognizing that this convention has selected a man who has campaigned in all parts of the country, who has worked entirely for the party, who will serve as an admirable running mate to Governor Stevenson, I hope that this convention will make F.C. Kefauver's nomination unanimous. Thank you.
Oh, he was terribly upset for a little while. Because, uh, you know, he was so close to being vice president. Des Moines Billings. But uh, afterwards, of course, he realized that Eisenhower being strong as he was, that uh, the chances probably of Stevenson winning weren't very great. And if uh, Stevenson lost, he could have easily been blamed on the Catholic situation and might have buried him permanently politically. As it was, the moment of defeat in the 1956 convention was his great moment. That was the instant, one biographer was to write, when he passed through a kind of political sound barrier to register on the nation's memory. Well, the fact is, though, that you were paying them a bribe then. I was paying them a bribe. A bribe. I paid it with the complete knowledge of the United States I'm government. I'm not talking now about that. I'm talking about your own responsibility. You know that that's prohibited by law for you to pay a bribe. Well, there's no bribe as far as I was concerned. But in the next year, and money, the next, and the one after that, this new voice kept registering on the nation's memory as that of a relentless investigator, a member of what was called the Senate Labor Rackets Committee, Robert Kennedy. Two other senators who had some national aspirations and relied on labor support refused to serve on this committee. Not only did he serve on it, but he didn't object to my being the counsel of the committee, so that therefore the Kennedys were involved in investigating labor unions. And this was at a period of time where labor and the Democratic Party were so close to one another, this was a very difficult political matter for him. But yet he thought it was the correct thing to do and it should be done, so he went ahead and did it. And it brought him to nationwide attention during that period of time. He decided very early that he would run for the presidency in 1960. And he chose the primary route. Bernard Booten. The New Hampshire primary, in fact, was unique in many ways because it was a testing of some new ideas, new campaign techniques. He was not interested in the political hacks. He was interested in the fresh blood, the new ideas. This, of course, was simply the forerunner of what took place in Wisconsin, took place in West Virginia, many other states of the nation. William Walton. One night at dinner would be February or March of 60. He said, how about coming to Wisconsin and campaigning for me? I said, well, you know, I'd be delighted to, but I wouldn't know what to do. He said, I don't know what you do. You go to Milwaukee, find Steve or find somebody, and just go to Milwaukee, <laughs> which I did, and got assigned Racine, Wisconsin, and surrounding counties to run the campaign in. Um, about six old pals carved up the state. There were 10 congressional districts, and they depended very heavily on Humphrey. Lemoyne Billings. Out of the 10, he won six. And the closest one was the second that he lost, that's from Madison, the capital. If he had won that second district, Humphrey, I'm sure, would not have gone to West Virginia. And we'd have all been very happy, because at the time we went into West Virginia, the polls showed he was 70%. And the only reason they were that high was that they didn't realize he was a Catholic. And as soon as they found out in West Virginia that he was a Catholic, it went down to 20 or something. And uh, it was then, again, just sheer, hard, gutsy work to sell the people of West Virginia on the fact that this was an important issue not to turn a man down because of his religion. But he did it. He arrived at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles with seven primaries behind him and seven victories. Bernard Booten. Every detail was worked out far in advance of the convention itself. He selected his lieutenants, gave them the mission, told them exactly what he wanted them to do, either personally or through Bob Kennedy, and this is exactly what was done. I remember uh, one day during the convention, one of the very early days, Bob saying that he had understood that there were those who had been to Disneyland the previous day and that if anyone in the group, and mind you, everyone there was a volunteer working at their own expense, if anyone felt that it was more important to see Disneyland than it was to nominate the next president of the United States, they should resign. And needless to say, no one resigned. The Democratic Party proudly presents to the nation, to the world, to the future, our next president, John F. Kennedy. It is time, in short, for a new generation of leadership. All over the world, particularly in the newer nations, 
Young men are coming to power. Men who are not bound by the traditions of the past. Men who are not blinded by the old fears and hate and rivalries. Young men who can cast off the old slogans and the old delusions. I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. It had been less than 15 years since he knocked on Dave Power's door in Charlestown and said, I am a candidate for Congress. Will you help me? And to many voters watching that night as he accepted his party's nomination in the Los Angeles Coliseum, he seemed too young to be president. But in the television debates and whistle-stop speeches of the campaign, the man the voters watched emerge had an instinct for the crucial point, a command of the facts, and a precise notion of the nature of presidential leadership. I don't run for the office of the presidency, saying that life in the 60s will be easy, because I don't think it will be. I think it will be a very dangerous time for us all. I think of the office of the presidency in the same way that Franklin Roosevelt thought of it and Woodrow Wilson, in the sense that they felt the chief task of the president was to set before the American people the things that they must do, the responsibilities that they must meet. Still, Richard Nixon pounded away at Senator Kennedy on the theme of immaturity and inexperience. I was there the morning that the decision on Lebanon was made. I was there when Trieste was decided. And my friends, this I know, that America at this time cannot afford to use the White House as a training ground to give experience to somebody at the expense of the United States of America. What Mr. Nixon doesn't understand is the President of the United States, Mr. Eisenhower, is not the candidate. You've seen those elephants in the circus. You know how they travel around the circus? By grabbing the tail of the elephant in front of them. That was all right in 1952 and 1956. Mr. Nixon hung on tight. But now Mr. Nixon meets the people. John F. Kennedy's youth receded into the background as a campaign issue. That left one other, more nebulous, more insidious, potentially more deadly, his religion. He confronted the Catholic issue bluntly before a meeting of Protestant ministers in Houston, Texas, and in doing so, he made what many judged to be the most eloquent speech of his campaign. For while this year it may be a Catholic against whom the finger of suspicion is pointed, in other years, it has been, and may someday be again, a Jew, or a Quaker, or a Unitarian, or a Baptist. Today, I may be the victim, but tomorrow, it may be you. Until the whole fabric of our harmonious society is ripped apart at a time of great national peril. If I should lose on the real issues, I shall return to my seat in the Senate, satisfied that I tried my best and was fairly judged. But if this election is decided on the basis that 40 million Americans lost their chance of being president on the day they were baptized, then it is the whole nation that will be the loser in the eyes of Catholics and non-Catholics around the world, in the eyes of history, and in the eyes of our own people. But if, on the other hand, I should win this election, then I shall devote every effort of mind and spirit to fulfilling the oath of the presidency practically identical, I might add, with the oath I have taken for 14 years in the Congress. For without reservation, I can, and I quote, solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, so help me God. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best He was elected ability, by the closest margin of this century, and he stood at the pinnacle. William Walton. The great day was coming on the 20th of January, I believe. The 18th, Evelyn Lincoln called me up about noon and said, we're coming over tomorrow. 
And I said, fine, come on over. And she said, I don't think you understand what I mean. She said, we're moving in tomorrow. I said, what for? She said, well, the president doesn't have any place to go. Jackie's kicking him out because everything has to be moved out of the house to the White House, and they'll be down to the last shreds of furniture, and there isn't any place to go. He's decided to come to you and just hung up. And I've got one cook, and this is all that runs the house. So the three of us, we just turned it into a little White House momentarily. Traffic was blocked, naturally, for two blocks out in front. It was solid cameras and press all over the street. And he would come out on the front steps about every half hour or hour and make another announcement of a new appointment or something like this. Marietta Tree came in. She was staying here, and she was down for the inauguration and just stuck her head in the dining room and said, I'm terribly proud to have you for my president. He looked up at her and he said, Well, Marietta, I'm terribly proud to have you for my citizen. <laughs> Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. President Kennedy said to me when they were settling down after inauguration, he said, I think you're the only man who came to work here and knew where the doors and windows were. His military aide, General Chester V. Clifton. I remember the first Saturday, they were all asked to come in the morning after inauguration. And of course, there'd been a gala party and 8.30 in the morning was sort of an early time. And there were large groups of people and it was at this point that they said, you go here. And they had all the girls that they had hired, the secretaries and stuff, and helpers and file clerks, all in the fishbowl room, in the fish room. And uh, people were coming by drawing a secretary, just, I'll take that one and follow off to your office. And this went on, and I'd never seen such a personnel management operation in my life. Charles Bartlett. I remember going there the second night he was in the White House, and it gave you the greatest lift because you had the feeling that he and Mrs. Kennedy both had this enormous desire to utilize this great office and this great opportunity in every possible way for the enhancement of the whole country. It was the most exhilarating thing to see two people who were just sort of going through every possible thing in which they might be useful to the uh, enhancement of the country. He loved the presidency. He just relished it. He, he, he savored it. <laughs> 